I want to start off, John, uh, with if you could just tell us about your um, church and f- uh, family upbringing uh, and how you came to Christ and um, just the, maybe c- can you take us through to about the age of 18? Or maybe, maybe no, student years. Well, let, let's do the early years, if that's all right. I scarcely remember them. <laughs> Well, I was born early last century. Um, Oops, thank you. I come, as many of you know, from a small country with a rather sad Christian history of sectarianism, which has played an indirect role in my life. My parents were believers, and I think they were a third generation of evangelical believers, humble people, without any formal education, but who loved the scriptures. And two fundamental principles. Firstly, my father was Christian without being sectarian, meaning that in the store he employed maximally about 40 people, and he tried to employ them across the Protestant-Catholic divide. Why did he do that? Because he believed the statement in Genesis that all of us, whether we believe in God or not, as human beings, are made in the image of God. That left a deep impression on me because he paid for that by being bombed several times. My brother nearly lost his life, but he maintained that stance. Secondly, he loved me enough to allow me space to think which wasn't always the case in the fairly narrow sociological church structures of Northern Ireland. And he encouraged me to read very widely. He, I recall when I was about 13, he gave me a book and I said, what is it, Dad? He said, it's the Communist Manifesto. Oh, I said, why should I read it? Because you need to know what other people think. Now, this is very enlightened for someone who'd left school at 16 to do that. And that started a habit of very wide reading. My father came across C.S. Lewis relatively early on, fed me Lewis, and I'd read all of Lewis's books, apart from the technical works in English literature, even before I went to university. I had the advantage of a friend who was ahead of me by about two years in that university. And our idea of a holiday is that when I could scrounge by one of the vehicles belonging to my father's store, we would pile it full of books by notables like Alfred North Whitehead and all sorts of very difficult philosophy, go and find a cheap B&B and spend a fortnight reading these books and discussing them. So I was very much involved in the intellectual understanding and defense of Christianity at an early age. And my, my father ran a little Bible class on a Sunday afternoon, and I found that very helpful because he was the sort of man that if he was in a group and he saw you were having a rough time, he'd take your part whether he agreed with you or not. And that's a very unusual thing. And when I went to Cambridge, he would come from time to time and he'd say, John, Invite 10 of your friends for a simple lunch and let me sit among them and ask questions. Again, something I didn't often see. So that background was important to me. I didn't have a lot of friends as a young person. I didn't need them, actually. My friends were my books. When I arrived at Cambridge, (coughs) getting in by some sort of supernatural intervention, I think, because... I think they got about one person into Cambridge from my school every 50 years. Um, I could see that it was important to stick my head above the parapet on day one. If Christianity was true, then it was inconsistent not to articulate it. So I jumped in at the deep end. In fact, I... A very cheeky young Irishman, Peter. But there was a Christian Union meeting 
And the man who fronted it, I thought, was so weak on his evidences that I tore him to shreds. And as a result, made a lot of non-Christian friends at the very beginning. They didn't know I was on the other side, but they, they, they discovered that later. The second important thing that happened was that I had no prior encounter really with atheism and agnosticism. I mean, Northern Ireland, you had people that would call themselves Protestant atheists and Catholic atheists, but there are no real atheists as far as I could see. And the opportunity to meet people who didn't share my worldview was, was a very important thing. <coughs> and one of the first people that didn't share my background, I think, he would say that he was at the time a kind of agnostic. I need to be careful because he's sitting in this room. And that brings back very happy memories indeed of that first encounter. And beginning to see students respond and to see that people can actually change their worldview. That was extremely important to me. In the narrow kind of confines that I grew up in, does this actually work? And you know, it, ha it doesn't haunt me, but it's, it's, it's really quite funny because when I debated Peter Singer mm -hmm. in Melbourne, I told them the story about my parents being Christian and their parents and so on. And he got up and he said, well, there you are. He said, that's, that's my main objection against religion of any kind <laughs> and Christianity in particular. People remain in the faith in which they were brought up. And I knew instantly I was going to have fun with that. So when I had the chance to speak, I said, Peter, I told him about my parents. You didn't tell him about yours. Were your parents atheists? And he said, yes. Oh, I said, you stayed in the faith in which you were brought up. Oh, but he said, it isn't a faith. Oh, I said, I was under the impression, Peter, you believed it. <laughs> now, there's a whole story behind that because cyberspace went mad at that point. <coughs> that here's one of the world's leading philosophers who did not appreciate that his atheism, flip side naturalism, was a belief system. And that's one of the huge problems in the society today because of the Dawkins redefinition of faith. We're constantly misunderstood when we use the word faith and we have to be very careful, but we can mm. get into that later. Yeah. But Cambridge was important because I made many friends. I began to see the gospel work. And then I had my crisis of faith regarding your field, and that is the authority of Scripture. But my <coughs> crisis was not everybody's crisis. My problem was I believed that Scripture was inspired, but I found it boring. And uh, being a moderately honest chap, I remember walking around Cambridge with the tears blinding me when I was 18. What is the point, really, when quite honestly, I find philosophy of science and mathematics much more interesting than the Bible. And here I am, I've signed that I believe the Bible is inspired and all that, but when I talk to people, and naughtily, as I did of course, say to them, do you believe Ezekiel is inspired? Oh yes, of course. What's it about? Pardon? <laughs> they hadn't a clue. And I rapidly came to the conclusion that people's so-called belief for the inspiration of scripture is purely technical. They have no idea of content or understanding. They simply signed on the dotted line for some reason. And I was really bothered about this. Prior to my leaving Ireland, my father, who was sensing that he was in a ghetto and he needed to get out of it intellectually, he was a very bright man just without the opportunity, heard a very new lecturer who'd come to Queen's Belfast to teach classics, Greek and Latin, his name David Gooding. And the moment Dad heard him, this was a window into a new world. Here was a clear, intelligent, argued exposition of scripture. So I was, what, 13 or so, and Dad said, you've got to come and hear this chap. And I think I first heard him, maybe 14, I sat at the back of a big conference, and I could almost repeat word for word what I heard that day. He said, why do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? It was because your mommy told you, <laughs> see. Or your Sunday school teacher, well, that's okay, but 
it's a bigger world than the world of your family and your Sunday school teacher. And then he took John 20 and argued through. And instantly, sitting right at the very back seat, I knew this is it. This is what I'm going to go for. I was only 13 or 14. But it made such powerful sense to me. And then I went whenever I could to just listen to him. He became a friend, he became a mentor, and he's taught me virtually everything I know, including what you've been listening to. But I'll explain that a bit later. That was important. So now here I am in Cambridge, worried about the Word of God and so on. I went round. He was at Tyndale House, Peter. Mm. I owe your institution a great deal. And I stumbled into Tyndale <coughs> House and I almost funked it. Should I admit to this great, brilliant chap who was in sabbatical, studying the Septuagint in some remote corner of your library? And I knocked the door and I went in, Oh, John, my boy, my boy, good to see you. I said, David, I have a deep problem. He said, what is it? Then I told him, and he started to laugh, which isn't always the best counselling method. You know. <laughs> I said, what are you laughing at? Well, he said, I was just reflecting. How good it is you got there at 18 rather than 50. And he said this. He said, you know, I'm doing a Bible study with a farmer friend of mine. This is the kind. David was a genius at the level of Lewis, I would put him. And he was doing a Bible study for one man who was a farmer with no formal education. And he said, would you like to come? Oh, I said, if I came, I'd spoil it. Well, he said, the farmer's wife makes a terrific meal. I'll come. <laughs> that evening changed my life completely. He said, we're going to have a look at Matthew. Now, Matthew, old boy, he stood up in the middle of the room. He covered the walls with old wallpaper, reversed so that we could write on it. And it was just like a revelation. Here's the first chap that takes scripture seriously as a book. Mm -hmm. And I woke up to the fact that I'd been treating it as less than a book, not as more than a book. And wasn't even applying the most simple of literary criteria to the reading and study of it. So he started chatting with Matthew and arguing with Matthew. And Matthew was getting a pretty rough time, actually, mm -hmm. uh, through all this dialogue. But that one evening would almost have been enough. It just did something to me that it had an authority, it had an authenticity, it had a ring of truth and it set me going. So I then started in the university gathering people of like mind around me and doing this until I ended up running a seminar for about 50 students in my research days, three hours every Sunday afternoon, because I noticed that a number of students, there was a very big Christian Union in Cambridge, over 500 meeting on a Saturday night. Imagine that, to listen to a Bible study by someone like John Stott and so on and so forth. But I noticed that many people dropped out of the Christian faith after they left university. And I thought, why is that? And it struck me that the reason was they had so many people around them to keep them warm and cozy in the ghetto that they never thought through their faith. And I thought this isn't good enough. And so I was learning from David Gooding and at the same time orchestrating, I think that's probably the right word, and managing a study uh, for people. And the Lord blessed us far better than we knew. And they're all over the world today. Some of them very gifted Bible teachers and evangelists and so on. So those were the, the kind of early days, Peter. And I've left lots out, but yeah, you so, keep asking the okay, question. Okay, so, so taking to the next stage, and I'm particularly wanting um, to hear, as we do the next stage, when you sensed, uh, or what you sensed about the next steps or vocation. Uh, so if, if we can go through, say, 20s and 30s, early career, and how you developed a sense of what you should be doing and, and pursuing next, and the sort of decisions you made. Can you take us through that? Thank you. I started trying to teach scripture publicly at about 16 or 17 because the kind of church tradition I grew up in allowed that. We didn't have uh, formal ministers and so some of us were perhaps rather too prematurely encouraged to find our feet and speak and I went to that kind of free church tradition in Cambridge. <coughs> 
and persuaded the leaders of the church that they ought to allow a fairly wide spectrum of students to come. And many students started teaching in those early days. And so teaching started really early. But simultaneously, I developed a constant dialoguing with people. And I've noticed all through my life that there's a great danger in simply performing in a pulpit. If you're not constantly dialoguing with people out there, you go stale. You need to be engaged. David once said to me, he said, never go away from the gospel. And I said, what on earth do you mean by that? He said, don't divide teaching and <coughs> preaching and evangelism into watertight compartments. Because you should be teaching the gospel. And you should actually be evangelizing Christians and teaching them the content of the gospel and very frequently speaking to them as if they were not Christians. I modify my talks very little, whether people are Christian or not Christian, because I feel if I'm explaining it, it ought to be intelligible and of impact with a non-Christian rather than speaking what the Germans beautifully call Die Sprache Kanaans. That is the language of Canaan speaking some sort of obscure language that only Christians under understand. I was developing in Bible study and I was committed to mathematics because one of the things I early learned was I was in full-time work. Often in life I've been told, John, you know, you really need to get into full-time work. Oh, I say it's far too late. No, it's never too late, you know. Yeah, you could you could start in full-time work. Oh, but I said you misunderstand me. You are too late. Why? I've been in full-time Christian work since I was a boy. Have you? Yes. Part of it is doing mathematics. Part of it is being a husband. Part of it's being a father. Part of it is teaching scripture. Part of it is witnessing. Wherever did you get the idea that full-time Christian work was pastoring? It isn't. And of course, I very much sensed, Peter, those early <coughs> days. And I was taught that way, that it is the norm for Christians to work with their own two hands or their mind, even if they're teachers in the church, as Paul told the leaders at, Elder, at Ephesus. Though... He made exceptions, and I believe in those too, that the leaders who worked well onto weariness where the church was told to support them. So I'm not against so-called full-time work. I am very against the terminology because in evangelical circles today, if I may say, I meet so many brilliant professional young Christians and they're told, if you want to be a serious Christian, you've got to go into the ministry. Where on earth does that expression come from? I'm in the ministry, mm -hmm. and I felt it actually very important for me to model that as best I could until I could take it no more in my early 50s. But we'll come to that in a minute. Now, career-wise, I got my PhD at a time when university lecturers, there were no jobs. <coughs> and uh, every job I applied for, there were 100 or more uh, people applying for it. It was very difficult. And I wondered what I would do. Should I teach in a school? <coughs> Should I go and work in industry? And so on and so forth. But <coughs> I kept going and applying and applying and applying for dozens and dozens and dozens of jobs. And in the end, my professor at Cambridge, who was very distinguished, invited me for lunch one day. And he said, John, he said, I've taken a terrible liberty. Oh, he said, what's that? professor. Well, he said, Cardiff wants a mathematician. And I have taken the extreme liberty of recommending you. Ha! And of course, I only realized later that there was no chance for anybody else once I'd been. And I went to Cardiff in Wales and spent 25 very happy years there. But I'd been told my attitude to my mathematics was very simple. I try to be as good a mathematician as I can be. I'm not in the top rank. And I won't sell my soul for it, because I'd seen enough <coughs> of that. I had worked with the Fellow of the Royal Society, who was a towering genius, one of the greatest men 
in his field in the 20th century and when he came to the end of life he got a bunch of papers and absolutely nothing else and I remember trying to say to him Professor Hall I said you know I'm a Christian what do you think of these things and he said something desperately sad to me he said John if the bishops don't believe why should I if the bishops don't believe why should I it was desperately sad and I saw the emptiness of it. Now I need to tell you there's another very significant event in my life happened when I was 19. I was browbeaten in an extreme form to attempt to get me to recant my faith by a Nobel Prize winner. I had the misfortune, well <laughs> I sat beside a Nobel Prize winner. I'd never met one before dinner one night in my college. And I tended to try to witness that any, to anything that moved and also many things that didn't move. <laughs> and I do it by the Socratic method because I learned very early on it's much easier to ask questions and answer them. And I developed a little bit of methodology that's been very useful that when I meet somebody new, I keep asking them questions until they ask me one. Now, for an Irish person, that's very difficult <laughs> because we've got a big message we need to get across. But no, 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 Socrates is my intellectual hero. So I was asking him questions and he rapidly got very angry. So I backed off. And at the end of the meal, he said, Lennox, I want you to come to my room. And the tone of voice in which he said it was not pleasant. And there were two or three other professors there and he invited them too. And he sat me down in the chair and he stood and the others. Now he said, would you like to have a career in science? I said, yes, sir. Well, he said, in front of witnesses tonight, I want you to give up this naive and childish faith in God. Because if you don't, you will suffer by comparison with your peers. You'll never make it. Pressure? I did a Nehemiah type prayer and said, Sir, tell me, what have you got to offer me that's better than what I've already got? <laughs> well, he said, there's the th philosophy of Bergson. I happen to know about the philosophy of Bergson. <laughs> he clearly didn't. <laughs> and I said, sir, with respect, if that's all you've got, I will happily stick with what I've got and take the risk. But I tell you, that puts steel into me. Hmm. That puts steel into me. And it was an extremely important experience where I was put on the line and challenged him and somehow the Dawkins of this world don't seem so impressive after that. And it happened to me when I was young. Mm. So it, it was very important. The next big important thing was my research supervisor, eventually, because my professor retired, which is very disappointing. But I was given a student of his to carry on as my supervisor and he was wonderful. And he said, John, you ought to go to Germany, you know, if you can. I said, why? Because he said they've got a wonderful scheme called the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowships. And you might get one. He said, especially if you come to this conference in Oberwolfach and meet some of the leading German scholars. So I did. And uh, at that time, I'd learned a bit of German for fun and I could speak it conversationally. So I very wisely chose one of the top German mathematicians and said, would you be prepared to uh, write a reference for me? Well, he heard me give a lecture and he, he did that. So I got this fellowship and went to Würzburg for a year. And two years later, I went to Freiburg. So I had two years uh, at the whole. The wonderful thing was, the man who looked after me in Würzburg turned out to be a believer. He was actually a Gideon, a lovely chap whose friendship I've enjoyed all his life. And we did a lot of research together. Career-wise, it was wonderful. But the moment I got there, I knew I got to get this language fluently. So for three hours every night, apart from everything else, for an entire year, 
I took the simple Bible notes that I already <coughs> had and translated them into German, sparing no punches to learn the theological vocabulary, not knowing why, because there wasn't a lot of church fellowship in Würzburg and uh, there was some, I went just to hear the language spoken and so on. But at the very end of the year, when we'd gone home actually, and I thought, what was the point of all of that? I suddenly got an invitation to Schloss Mittersill to a conference, which was German speaking. And I went, and that little trigger started me going into Eastern Europe. First Hungary, and then, and many times, into the German Dem Democratic Republic. I was more in the East than in the West during the Cold War. And that was wonderful for many reasons. It gave me the opportunity to encourage humble Christians who were refused higher education. And somehow that stuck in me. In East Germany, they had a system called the Jugendfeier, which was an atheist parody of confirmation. And many a bright child I met, a Christian, who was told at school that she or he could not do any further education, university or even high school, if they wouldn't swear allegiance to the atheistic state. And somehow I felt, me with all the education I would got, it would be a nice thing if I would be allowed to go and encourage these Christians. So all through, the, particularly down in the area around um, the... <clears throat> mountains that divide East Germany from the, from the Czech Republic now. I went many times and taught in the little churches and I'd go to a village of 2,000 and 1,000 would come out and hear me speak and expound scripture through the medium of German. And there were many years I spoke far more German than English mm -hmm. going around. And those were Christian contacts. Mm -hmm. But they taught me what atheism does when it's systemized as a political philosophy. Now, I know the situation is more complex than that, but that was very important. And it was very important from another point of view. Uh, it taught me a lot about Europe and the way Europeans think as distinct from Brits. I know we're Europeans for a while. Um, but learning about Germany, reading German literature, Interacting was a phenomenally enriching thing. Even taught me how to read Boltman, you know. But anyway, that's another story. Um, and I have retained a lot of links there. And so it was a steady diet of Bible teaching, mathematics, and so on, and just letting it happen. Mm -hmm. Just letting it happen. My wife and children came with me. They enjoyed living in Germany. The German people, Christians, were very kind to us, inordinately kind. And we made deep friendships. And as a result of that, over the years, I've been able to give many lectures, not only on mathematics, but on, on the intellectual defense of Christianity in major German universities. So that laid a big foundation, mm -hmm. not only for the West, the German-speaking world, but for the East, because at that time, the best interpreters were German-speaking, not English-speaking. That has changed completely. I go to Poland in those days. I've been in almost every village within miles, within 100 miles of here, speaking many times. I recognize all the names and so on. I've even been here. But it was all German, never English, because nobody spoke English. Now it's all English. So it has, has changed, and it was learning just from the experience of people who had been imprisoned. This country, Poland, suffered horrendously during the Second World War. And it exposed me to places like Auschwitz and, and all this kind of thing, and, and coming to grapple with the hardest question of all, the problem of suffering and evil. So it was all a learning thing. I was based in Cardiff, and most of the teaching I did was in little churches witnessing to the students, giving talks for inter-varsity as it then was UCCF, beginning to travel a bit in the UK and beginning to speak in conferences. That came slowly and I was just reactive. I didn't have any real system. I just uh, discussed with my wife every invitation. By the way, that's extremely important. 
I hope you all do it, gentlemen. I've seen so many marriages go on the rocks because people get invited and they say, my wife will understand, I don't need to ask her. You do need to ask her. I will never accept an invitation that my wife hasn't uh, approved, never. And you can check that with her if you like. But that's important. And we're bringing up a family and so on. So there was a limitation. But all the time I was, David Gooding had injected me with some sort of genetic disorder of the brain that meant that I was constantly wanting to find out more about Scripture. And he had taught me to take a book at a time and really spend a lot of time with it. Yes, use commentaries, of course. Be dependent on what's gone before. But do your own hard thinking. And I developed a habit of doing that, which meant there were a lot of other things I couldn't do. And as I said this morning, my wife gave me the space to do it, which was not always easy. She took a tremendous weight off my uh, back, so to speak, to allow me to develop those things in those early days. So, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go on uh, to, the, to the next years, but just at this point, I wonder if you could describe for us the makeup of your time distribution. Um, uh, you know, as in how much time did you give to Bible study and so on? Obviously, there was certain, it, one year you were doing three hours German a night, but, but if you can sort of take a, a representative year and give us a sense of, of how you would divide up time, this, is, that, is that okay? It's okay, but it's impossible. <laughs> Do you know, what has helped me most in this question was somebody who said to me many years ago, John, do you think that you solve all this problem by the time you're 35 and then you begin to live? And I said, yes. Well, he said, you've got it wrong. Solving that problem is living. And do you know, I find that inordinately helpful. This idea that we get this all sorted out and then we live is completely false. Because living is dynamically solving that problem. And there's no typical year mm -hmm. in, my, in my life. But there were certain priorities which weren't always held to because there are family constraints. And, you know, if you're studying the feasts of the Lord in Leviticus and there's a screaming child and your wife is desperate for help, you can't say, well, Leviticus is much more important, my dear. Keep doing that until you die. You just can't do it. You, you've got to learn a sense of proportion and sensitivity to the things <coughs> around you. And there are certain things you cannot do. And I learned fairly early on not to take on things that were peripheral. It's a bit like the Act 6 situation this morning gear yourself to this. Secondly, in the very early days, my preparation often was, I'd be invited to preach in some little valley church in Wales, and I'm so thankful to those little valley churches that put up with me, goodness me, when I didn't speak a word of the language of heaven, which is Welsh according to them. Um, <clears throat> They were very kind to me, and I used to do lengthy series. I mean, 26 lectures in one, or 10 in another, and 20 in another, every week, you see. And that was, that was great. And I used to say, well, I got this series, I need to prepare. But David Gooding soon talked me out of that. He said, you run into the ground with that. I said, well, what do you do? He said, I study scripture and let my talk come out of that. That's the exact opposite way round. That is, he is studying the Word of God. And then somebody says, will you come and do a series of talks? And he does it on what he is studying. And I find that such a relief. To be studying constantly and letting your talks come out of that as far as possible. And it's not always possible because the Christian Union would... Uh, write and say, we'd like you to talk of the evidence for the resurrection. Well, if you're studying um, Genesis uh, or, or something, you, you obviously have to break off to do that. But that was a very helpful thing to do. Keep the study going, not simply, and here's the thing, 
There is a big risk in always preparing stuff for other people and never letting it affect yourself. That is a huge danger for people who are busy with God's word. That they're not in that sense, and it affects me as well. And David again taught me that. He said, why do you study scripture? To get sermons. He said, what a misery. He said, I study scripture to see God and to hear his word. Well, boy, was that a rebuke. And he said, if you do that, you'll have something to say to people. So this motivation was very important to sort out. Now, often it was difficult, but because I had worked, and this is where having a mentor of his quality was so important, I'd seen the hours he would spend wrestling and getting nowhere. And many of us are not prepared to get nowhere. David's story is interesting. During the war, for his own personal reasons, he was a conscientious objector and he was put to work very dirty and hard work on a farm. And he was studying scripture and he was getting nowhere, month after month after month. And he was studying in the evenings after a very hard day work. And he said one day, he said, I prayed to the Lord, I was getting nowhere. And then I changed the book of the Bible and I get nowhere there. And then I go somewhere else and I get nowhere there. And suddenly, I decided, well, I might as well stick with one and get nowhere, as get nowhere everywhere. And he went to Luke's gospel. And one day he noticed that three stories in Luke 5 formed a natural, logical progression. And that transformed his life and mine subsequently, as he began to see how scripture is structured. And that getting nowhere, that's the hard thing. We all want instant food, but you know, a nicely prepared meal is much more aesthetically satisfying and culinarily satisfying than a tin of baked beans that's instantly produced. So those were basic lessons that I was learning all through that time of being a young father, a young lecturer, and I had a lot of stuff to do in the university, but it slowly built up. <coughs> There was one, oh, well, I, it'll occur to me, you keep asking. We'll okay, so, well, it's, it's really just taking us through the next decade and, and the move to Oxford and, you know, what, what was going on in your mind with, with that. And uh, I, I, the question afterwards is going to be um, the, the debates. And, okay, and the that's fine. So, that's, so, so that's I, fine. I want, want you to sort of take us up to there, if that's all right. Because I'd studied books as wholes, so I've got some rudimentary idea of a number of books. I started fairly intensively going, traveling, to perhaps five or six times a year. My head of department was a curious man in that he lived a long way from the university and as long as we produced the research, he didn't mind where we did it. Now that was such a godsend because what I did, for example, in the summer, I'd go to somewhere like Budapest. I would live with a childless couple. I would do mathematics for eight hours a day, and then I'd do three hours Bible teaching every night with three different interpreters for a week. So we get through quite a few hours of speaking, and I'd do a whole book each year, and a different book each year. And so I began to develop a certain vocabulary of books I'd be trying to get to grips with new books, and then I would teach them in Hungary, and then I'd say, well, you know, there's a lot more to this. So I'd teach it in Poland, and then I'd teach it in East Germany, and I'd teach it in Austria, say. And uh, David's words would ring in my ears, you know, when you've taught it about 10 times, you'll begin to have some idea what it's about. <laughs> and that was wonderful. And student work began, particularly in Austria, and I owe IFES a great debt. I was accidentally invited to this conference, and I started a student conference annually, German-speaking, in Austria. 
And for 14 years I did that with a different book each year and also did preaching classes. Sometimes I did two or three books. I do a major book and then I do evangelistic evenings where people would come from the valleys in and those were greatly blessed. So in the USM, uh, the Österreichische Studentenmission. Uh, and those were a great ground because you could never repeat. And there were there was a horde of young people that grew up with me and I trained them and many of them are today in very active Christian work, particularly in Austria and elsewhere. So that, that was a marvelous thing. Similarly, I looked for such young people in other countries to try to mentor them, particularly in Hungary, but not only there. And that kept going from 1976 to 1989. And it became more intensive because as they got to know me, they'd bring all the Bible teachers together. For instance, and I remember on a number of occasions, I flew to Berlin on a Friday, crossed Checkpoint Charlie, and did between 10 and 16 hours Bible teaching before I was back at my work desk on Monday morning. It was hard work. I used to do more teaching than the average minister in a church in a weekend than they did in a year. I noticed that many times. That was okay. The Lord helped me to do it. And a number of people would come. They'd record the things with many little tape recorders. And then they'd use the stuff in their villages through the next year. And so I became a kind of resource person. I ought to add something else. David Gooding in those days was very friendly with Spain. And he said, I think you ought to come to Spain to me. And I thought, what for? Well, he said, I think you should do one or two talks on Christianity and science. Well, I didn't know much about it really. I'd read quite a bit and I'd been interested. And so I went out little realizing that I was in for a very rough time. He said, oh, by the way, he said, I, I'm actually doing too much teaching. I've been teaching two or three books every year at this camp. So I'd like you to do the book of Timothy, my boy. Oh, my heart sank. With you listening to it? Yes, he said, with me listening to it. And I'll never forget that. Talk about fearsome. Because David Gooding is the kindest man. But when it comes to criticism and helping you sort out your arguments, I'll never forget the first talk I gave. Well, my boy, you lost them after about 20 minutes. And it sounded like a little bit of noise going on at the pulpit. <laughs> well, I wanted to take the next plane home. But I realized he was being kind. Now he said, let's look at this. Your logic was faulty. And we need to look at this. And you missed the main thrust of this. And woomph. And he spent an hour or two every day. I would prepare the next days. I would tell him what I was going to say. And he would rip it to shreds. It was the hardest education I've ever had. But my, was it worth it. My, was it worth it. And I got up to the stage where I could just about speak a sermon and uh, do it in Spanish. And uh, that left him slightly behind, which was nice. But, <laughs> but I decided to do tit for tat. I said, David, you've brought me to Spain. I need to bring you to Germany. So he then came to Germany, and I acted as his interpreter. And I, can I tell a funny story? Mm. Because it's just really. David tests interpreters in a, in a naughty way, in that he uses immensely long sentences and very complex vocabulary. And he tells impossible, untranslatable jokes. <laughs> so I thought, you need to learn something, my friend. So he said some very long sentence, and I translated it. And then he said something else, and I translated it. And then he said something else, and I didn't say anything. And he started, why don't you say it? I said, I've already said it. I knew what you were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next thing was he, he told an untranslatable joke and the whole place erupted in laughter. And after the talk, he said, how did you do that? 
I said very simply, I just told him this absurd Englishman has told an untranslatable joke. Please be polite and laugh. <laughs> 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 uh, and that experience of learning to be an interpreter was very useful actually. It leads you into strong temptation to change the message. Uh, not with David Gooding so much, but I've had that um, danger presented temptation before. But it was wonderful training, absolutely wonderful <coughs> training to travel with someone, to be able to discuss things. You know, you listen to me talk about Acts. I've been talking to David Gooding about Acts for 50 years. Well, you learn a thing or two over that sort of time. Mm. And I'm just so indebted that I've had that opportunity and tried, not as effectively by far, but tried to help other people in that similar way. But I was privileged to get this just at, the, at late boyhood. So that was all feeding mm. into what I was doing in this country. Right, and then if we can uh, go on to Oxford, uh, moving to Oxford, what, what made you uh, do that and, and what, what happened when you first arrived? I was doing so much Bible teaching and I was rated a good teacher by the university and they were merciless. I was given the biggest classes, I had no marking assistance and yet I had to turn out the research. And I was doing all this teaching. And I gradually came to see in my late 40s and early 50s that it wouldn't last much longer. So I chatted to my wife and I said, I think I need to apply for early retirement. So I did. And the vice chancellor of the university said, no chance. I said, why? Well, he said, your teaching record. We need you. I said, I know, that's why I want to retire. <laughs> and he made a kind of a joke. Well, he said, I tell you what, if you can get someone with a million pounds in research grants, I might think of it. I found such a person. <laughs> right, well, yes. And <laughs> I was given early retirement. I didn't know what I was going to do. But we felt before the Lord that I got to take this step. So I'm what, 52 or something? And I'm out of the university system. I'm a retired person. I've been a pensioner for all those years, see. So now things become utterly extraordinary. Somebody suggested that I might find a hat to wear if I were to attach myself to UCCF. Now Tyndale House is the important institution, but there used to be a much lesser institution at Oxford called the Whitfield Institute, which existed to funnel limited funds to bright Christians to do PhDs where they wouldn't get state funding. And the idea was I should maybe go to that and just continue teaching and preaching and, and so on. And the man that suggested it was a very close friend, a Dickensian sort of character, but I respected him greatly. And somehow I thought, well, maybe. So I went for an interview and um, the idea was we would go to Oxford uh, because that's where it was. And at the last two minutes of the interview, the director of that outfit, who is an ethicist, said to me, of course, if you had an academic project, we might be able to get an attachment with Oxford University because I'm a fellow of Green College and I'm their chaplain. Oh, I said, have you got any project? Well, I said, oddly enough, my very last mathematics conference in Italy, I was approached by one of the world's leading people in my field and he said to me, come and have coffee, I am going to write a book on such and such. Oh, I said, Derek, that's wonderful. He said, I haven't finished yet. You're going to write it with me. Oh, I said, no, I'm out. I'm completely out. I've retired officially. I'm not going to write it. Well, he said, look, 
I would like you to write it because you've already done one that's been a considerable success with another colleague and I would like, and it was a huge honour because this man's a genius and it was to write a, an Oxford mathematical monograph which would be a standard work which it became. I said, no Derek, no, I, I just, I don't have the energy. I remembered this and I was told, well, why don't you apply for a research fellowship? So here's me, who's been an academic all my life, going for the lowliest post in existence in Oxford. But I was dutifully interviewed and got a research fellowship to write this book. So back I was into academia. I wrote the book and ended up a full professor at Oxford. That's a unique trajectory, actually. and Only the Lord could do something like that. And, of course, discovered that the cache of Oxford was a phenomenal door opener. Now, that was 20 odd years ago. The Dawkins stuff didn't come till, when was my first debate? Was it 12 years ago? And there's something I've totally forgotten that's relevant, Peter, and that is it was, it was less than 12 years ago. Um, 2007, I think. Yeah. 2007, thanks, Alexander. The other thing I need to say to you, which I've forgotten, but it's relevant to all of this. In 89, mm -hmm. the wall fell. I helped knock it down. My wife sent me to Berlin. She said, you can't have lived so often there and not go and see what's going on. So I helped knock it down. Instantly, my connection with Eastern Europe stopped. And the Lord, I haven't talked about guidance, and I don't really have time to, but twice in my life I've been guided in a way that I can only understand as being direct and very supernatural. And I started going to Russia, or the former Soviet Union, in 89. And I had amplified my very small salary to keep my family alive by translating Russian mathematics. And of course, reading Russian mathematics, I got to the stage where I could lecture in it. And that opened every door in the Academy of Sciences in the former Soviet Union. And that was an absolute miracle. So I started going. The story is fascinating, but if there's time at the end, I might tell it because it was so of God. And began to get involved in with David Gooding, because I now enlisted him, to write articles defending Christianity that were published in Poisk, which is the leading Academy of Sciences newspaper. And everybody in the academic world of Russia was interested in how I could possibly be a believer. So there I was as a guest of the Academy of Sciences. My first visit ran for two months in Siberia, Akadim Gododok. And that opened so many doors, and that's a whole story in itself, how we came to write books in Russian and all sorts. I've written a lot of stuff that's never appeared in English, and none of you even know about, but that's another story. But it was exposing me to deep communism mm -hmm. and atheism. And I didn't know that this was all a wonderful preparation for meeting Richard Dawkins, who hasn't a clue about atheism, really, in its <coughs> actual form. Based in Oxford, I started lecturing again and unfortunately rapidly achieved some considerable success and was very much in danger of being sucked back into it. And um, in the end, they said, look, this course is going marvelously well. We want you to rewrite the syllabus. I said, no, because they were paying me peanuts for doing this. You know, they, they love cheap labor and I was a, a research fellow. But anyway, all of that, I managed to get my designation changed in my college to be a fellow in mathematics and the philosophy of science. And that meant I could start working in the things that I published and they filtered into my academic work and I got involved with the first Oxford professor of science and religion in setting up a course on science and religion and I went to him and I found he was quite lonely had no help and I said can I help you 
He said, what's your formal education in science and religion? I said, none. But I tell you what, I'll do your course, Master of Studies in Science and Religion, and I'll do the exam and get the qualifications. And he looked at me. He said, come to the course, but you're not doing the exam. He said, you've far too many degrees already. So I did that entire course mm -hmm. at Oxford that Alistair McGrath now runs. And then I helped him run it because he hadn't the chance, the poor man, to go to conferences. And I said, I'll do your lectures while you go to conferences. And that gave me the experience of teaching this stuff at an academic level. And all of this was marvelous, you see. And um, so it opened a new faculty to me. I, I, I became a member of the Faculty of Theology. <laughs> Oh, I know. <laughs> Peter, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, Oxford is a, an interesting place. But anyway, um, I'm also now a member of the Faculty of Business Studies, but that's another story and is relevant to what I do, very relevant at the moment. So, all of that. And then I got to know a man called Larry Taunton. This is a very significant move. And again, it was so clearly guided. Wycliffe Hall in Oxford, I became a faculty member there because I taught preaching at Wycliffe Hall, believe it or not, um, before they had a, a person installed to do it full time. I, I, I did some of the teaching. And anyway, I was asked to give some lecture in an awful room, the refectory at Wycliffe Hall. Ooh. Exactly. <laughs> and. I gave this lecture and I was tired and I wanted to go home and there was a big line of people wanted to ask questions and I asked the Lord for grace. I don't know how much he gave me but I came to the very end of the line, this is a chap two meters tall nearly, and he said, fella, he said, how would you ever think of coming to Alabama? <laughs> Do you know where Alabama is? And I said, I sure do. And I was so weary, I said to him, well, it would have to be something really serious, you see. Thank you, sir. Six weeks later, I got a letter. Dear Professor Lennox, I can organize one, two, three, four, five, six. And I could instantly see the man had really done work getting me into science institutions, leading country clubs, businesses, um, and all kinds of stuff. And then very cheekily, he put at the bottom of the letter, now I need to know if you're serious. <laughs> 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 I showed it to my wife and she laughed. She said, you'll have to do something here. <laughs> I went, it was magnificent. He'd worked. And he got me into everywhere, including several of the universities there and so on and so forth. And he then told me the story. He said, I had a burden for my city. And there were many churches in Alabama, but they weren't reaching the secular community. And I agonized and I prayed, Lord, show me how to do this. And I decided to come to Europe because I could find no opening. And he said, I took a summer in Europe going from conference to conference. And he said, they were awful. And I went to this conference and I got to one lecture after the other, got nothing, was going home the next day, was going up the stairs to bed when I saw that something was happening this last lecture. And I thought, well, I might as well go and be miserable at this lecture. <laughs> he went in and he said, 30 seconds after you started, I knew I'd found what I'd come to Europe for. Now, he's the man who eventually organized all my major public debates. And he did it very cleverly. He's a brilliant writer. And if you want, a very interesting book to read. Try reading The Faith of Christopher Hitchens. It's a fascinating read. But anyway, <coughs> he wrote to Dawkins without telling me, except that the letter was addressed to both of us. Dear Professor Dawkins, dear Professor Lennox, we'd like a flavor of the Oxford debate on God in Alabama. Would you come? Well, Dawkins said, well, 
goodness me, who on earth is Lennox? I've never heard of him. You'd better get somebody like Francis Collins of the Archbishop of Canterbury, and then I might come. And Larry wrote back and he said, well, he said, you know, we know Lennox in Alabama, <laughs> and we don't know Francis Collins so well. And as for the Archbishop of Canterbury, he said, we're not all Episcopalians in <laughs> Alabama. <laughs> So Dawkins, who didn't know Lennox, said, OK, I'll come, provided you give me an armed bodyguard. So I had an armed bodyguard. It was very interesting. I'd never met Dawkins before. And uh, Larry interviewed at, his lunch, at lunch, and it went very well. And then we had this evening thing in this huge arena with my armed bodyguard walking and the walkie-talkies going and all of this. And as we walked in, he turned to me and he said, you know, I don't debate. Well, of course, I knew that, especially people like me. And I said, Richard, if it's any comfort, I don't debate. I've never done anything like this in my life before. But what I intend to do is go into that room and attempt to present a credible alternative to your atheism. He said, I buy that. And then we went. And the rest is history in a way, because the... Sadly, the debate was spoiled by a radio station that ought to have known better and had no right to do so. They cut it short. But that meant that in the last few minutes, I compressed. We'd each been given nine minutes to sum up. I'd spent, what, three months preparing those nine minutes full time? That debate cost me more or less a year's work, I would say. These things are desperately serious because Christianity is at stake. And suddenly that was just wiped, taken from us. And so I concentrated on the resurrection, which turned out to be the most effective thing. And dozens of people have been converted directly through uh, watching the debate and still are today through mm. the Internet. But what I didn't realize, that gave me a global audience almost overnight mm. and led on to many, many other things. So if you make more precise the questioning now, I will respond to it. Well, that's uh, phenomenal. So um, just t t take us then through the immediate <coughs> aftermath of the, of, of, of the debate and some of the opportunities it's given you in Oxford. And then I, I think what, what we'll end with yeah, is um, if I can, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to think ask the final question is what you would want these guys to do as they consider witness in the academy. Yes. Uh, but um, perhaps you can wrap that up into one, and then there may be time for one question. We'll what see. was the first question? So, so just the immediate aftermath of, of the debate and what, what's happened since then, and but then also what what you most want these people or us all to take on as we consider being witnesses in the academy. What the debate did was, although it wasn't, I could have done it infinitely better if I could have run it again, you know. These things are very imperfect. I did several of them. Larry organized them, and each one gave me a step up. The debates with Hitchens were very important. And the point is they opened many doors for me because in Oxford, I'm in a secular college, but my colleagues support me way beyond what I deserve. Indeed, I discovered that as far as donors to the college of money, the college was handing out to them a copy of my book. So here's the college giving Christian books to donors at a secular institution. But my colleagues know I will never embarrass them. And the result of that is when they bring their guests in, I'm an interesting person, you see. This is John Lennox, by the way. And do you know he debated Richard Dawkins? Well, that's an open door for talking to people. So I've had endless conversations, short-circuited into Christianity because people are just fascinated. What's Dawkins like? And of course, a lot of secular people don't like him at all. Mm -hmm. So that succession of things went for a while until I realized that many atheists realized that confrontational debates are not ideal. Mm. I don't do them anymore. They're far too stressful. 
They involve enormous work if you take them seriously. Just unbelievable, the preparation that's necessary. Hundreds and hundreds of hours. And it's 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. What I much prefer, and atheists do now, is moderated discussions. But the problem is finding top-rate moderators. They're very rare, because moderators who are bright want to participate, and then, of course, the thing is a disaster. But I've developed all kinds of formats, and I can discuss those. I think one of, some of the best were in Australia, where I did six cities with huge audiences, around two to two and a half thousand every time, packed out, contrary to any expectation, where I had 29 minutes to speak. And then I was interviewed for an hour by a media <coughs> personality who wasn't a, who wasn't a Christian. That worked extremely well, and the media personality worked in questions from an iPad from the audience. Those went awfully well. And uh, having debated Dawkins and Hitchens and Singer and a number of other so-called luminaries, the brights, they're all brights, as you know, um, it just meant it opened virtually every door. And the final point I'd make is I've... Over the last five years, I think I've done 60, between 60 and 70 lectures in major American institutions, in all the Ivy League universities, that are debates, moderated discussions, and they're all in the internet, Veritas Forum, downloadable for free, because those have been extremely effective in getting the message out, because increasingly, my wife has always said, I prayed that God would do something so that you could get your message on the large scale. And that happened with Dawkins. Mm -hmm. And the final question? So, <coughs> thinking about us all here. Um, yes. Every individual is unique. We're delighted that God has gifted you to the church. But how would you advise these people to, to follow their calling and gifting? The important thing is that we're not all called to do the same thing because it'd be boring. And there's always danger in reciting your own story. Mm -hmm. It's not transferable. And that's, that's important because you've been called specially to do what only you can do and I cannot do. I think the principles I talked about earlier are the crucial things. If you and Virtually all of you, you're here for a reason because you are articulate, you are able to get involved in a public sphere somewhere. And therefore, you need to be prepared. And you need to be prepared with spiritual authority, not just intellectual authority. And so all of us, I think, we need to take scripture more seriously than we've done up until now. That I, I mean, I don't know you, and I can speak freely. I know some of you take scripture much more seriously than I do. But that was the big lesson that I saw modeled, that this is actually very hard work, and God will not do it for you. He'll help you. He'll give you advice through friends. He'll empower you by his spirit, but he will not save you from what you need to do to become qualified to enter these arenas. And then just see what God does. <clears throat> I didn't start by debating Richard Dawkins. I started by talking to fellow students. And all my life, the thing that sticks with me is constantly be engaging with the non-Christian world. If a week goes by and I haven't talked to somebody, I begin to wonder what's wrong. Because that will supply to you the questions that you need to think about. And they'll be living questions because they're coming from living people. Now, within all of that, we'll have different callings. Some will be called, because they understand the human personality well, to, to work in counseling and psychiatry. Other people will be called to develop many other different areas. They'll be called to the disciplines of providing the rest of us with authoritative manuscripts of scripture and defending it as Peter does at Tyndale House. All the things, and you can't do both. Mm -hmm. You can't do everything. Although you make a pretty good job of doing <laughs> everything. <laughs> but that's important. And you can see in Peter's case, if he doesn't mind me saying so, 
that he doesn't simply do research. He's standing up in public translating his research into the benefit of the Christian and non-Christian community and therefore engaging at that level. And what I encourage younger people to do is this. Go and write a talk that you would give if you're given half an hour to relate your intellectual discipline to your Christian faith. The big problem I see out there is the tendency to do talks that go like this. I study applied basket weaving and I'm very interested in the way in which the baskets I make perform when they're immersed in sulfuric acid. And some of the tests I have done reveal this and this and this and this. And isn't that really fascinating? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I happen to be a Christian. Here's my testimony. That can work, but I've rarely heard it work well. What we need is the capacity to integrate so that it's not our subject here and then the faith bit there. We become so atheistic in our thinking. People even ask me to give lectures on science and faith. And I say, excuse me, do you want me to talk about God? Well, of course. I said, I don't see God there. Faith. I said, but that's your problem. I can talk about science and faith without mentioning God because faith is necessary in science. And your title is giving the impression there's science there. It doesn't need faith. There's faith there which is an ambiguous statement, which means A, the Christian religion, or B, my subjective faith. And you've confused people, and Richard Dawkins claps his hands. Please, ladies and gentlemen, may I plead with you, watch when you use the word faith that you complete the sentence. Faith in what? It's very important. So I'd encourage you, but the bottom line for me is this the seeking God in his word. Now, I'm not, I'm not a, a touchy-feely person at all, but I do believe God gives us an intuitive sense, and we know when we've heard him speak. And I'll finish with a story I told probably last time. One of my best friends who came to my college studies those days, and we agreed that the one that died first, the other would speak at his funeral. He was younger than me, he expected me to die first. But I had to preach at his funeral, and I asked him what I should do. And he said, you tell them, he said, to do what we did when we were students at Cambridge. To spend time before God, prayerfully studying his word, and wait till the face of God appears. And then he added this, he said, then they'll have something to say. And that's the bottom line for me. I just asked you, do you want to have something to say that's got authority? I know only one way of getting there. We read this morning at the start, the God of glory appeared to Abraham. It needs to happen to me. The God of glory appeared to Paul. It happened to him. That drove the gospel to Europe. And if we don't have that sense, because we're preparing sermons for other people all the time, we're not listening to God's voice. We're trying to get something to say that might be marginally interesting and relevant to Scripture. We need to raise the bar very much higher than that. Great. Well, I'm going to take the microphone and I'm going to close in prayer. And then after that, we'll, we'll thank John. Let's just pray. Thank you, Lord God, uh, that you are the God of your people, that you give uh, such amazing people as gifts to your church. Thank you for the gift of uh, John. Thank you for Sally. And thank you that uh, you have uh, given them to us. And thank you for all that you've enabled. And I pray that, Lord, you would um, help us from this to be inspired to study your word and also to trust you and follow you in our vocations to recognize that you can open doors that people thought simply couldn't be opened. And we ask that you'll be opening many, many doors in Europe for the gospel, in the universities, in the academies, doors that people simply think, thought could not be opened for uh, us all here. Uh, Lord, continue to give John much strength uh, in all that he does, and thank you for him again. In Christ's name. Amen.